Boa tarde a todos. É um prazer, uma honra poder abrir esse painel no Congresso. Good afternoon. It's an honor to open this panel. Traditional panel of IBDT. And we will deal in this panel the main challenges presented by BEPS for developing countries. Therefore, we have two lecturers from Brazil, Professor Sergio André and Paul Rosenblatt, and two from abroad, two panelists from abroad, Professor Natalia from Colombia and Professor Craig West, from Professor of Cape Town University, developing countries, and they are facing apparently the same problems that Brazil is and will be facing with the differences, the difference that Colombia became a member of OCD. So, so we want to learn more about Colombia, not only football, but also how to they became members of OECD. Colombia became a member of OECD last April. So, and before passing the floor to Adriana Brito, uh, undergraduate of the course of international law, tax law and IBDT, she will lead this panel. But before passing the floor to Adriana, I would like just to do a comparison, something that I thought regarding this saying that became the most famous one apparently worldwide currently, which is global challenges need global solutions. And it's becoming a bit repetitive, but we have here a relation with COVID and BEPS, both challenges that we have that must have global solutions. And the work of OECD that we will address during this panel with the main pillars of BEPS plan erosion of tax bases of rich, rich countries is something clear, but without the cooperation of developing countries and those known as tax havens, the OECD would not find a global solution as it apparently is finding with the multilateral treaties. The brief introduction for the panel, and Adriana, please, I pass the floor for you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you all. It's an enormous pleasure as a master's student being part of this event with high level professors. First of all, I thank IBDT for the invitation via Luis Flavio, and I greet the exponent persons that are part of this panel. Before starting about the theme, I would like to recall that we have a simultaneous translation in this event. You can listen into English or into Portuguese. You have an icon on your screen. Interpretation is there. So it's important to repeat that. Besides that, it's also important to interact with us, send your comments, and uh, if your questions not address specifically to this panel, we will have a panel to Q&A tomorrow, 1700 Brazilian time. After this clarification, I would invite Sérgio de Hauser, professor, to do the summary overview. What would be the standard now? I would like to. What would be the minimum standard? It's a pleasure to be here taking part with you. I 
have to start saying greeting IBTT, IBDT for this forum via Ricardo Marins Oliveira, president, and also Professor Eduardo, Luiz Eduardo Schwere, my dear intellectual author of this forum. And uh, it's always a pleasure. We wait to look forward to it. It's the mastermind. Uh, so we greet our friends this year virtually, but we hope next year we are together physically. And we also greet Luis Fravio, dear Luis Fravio, coordinator of the master program of IBDT that is improving a lot. And the work is done by him and several other skilled prof professors. And Luis Flavio is now ahead of it with new ideas that will foster the program. And uh, after these comments, and thank you all, I greet my colleagues of the panelists via the chair, Adriana Brito. You know, in one week's time, we had two events. Last week, we were in the International Tax Review Seminar. And uh, it's have a good forum. It's a pleasure to be here. My theme is an introduction to the theme, in fact. I will share slides with you, and I'll cover them, the part that refers to me. How will we discuss it? Inclusive framework and minimum standard of BEPS project. I think it makes sense in this introduction to take the opportunity to pinpoint before going specifically to the minimum standard. So the transition that the tax law, internationally speaking, is crossing over the last de decade. If you studied for longer time, you will recall the debate on the past concerning international taxation was basically oriented by unilateral position of each country. Sometimes uh, some bilateral effort when there was some orchestration to find a solution, mainly in the context of uh, avoiding double taxation in the bilateral transactions. So international tax law, it was in the past essentially bilateral, the studies. And so, of course, you all heard about the convention of bilaterality, exceptions to the rules. We had some Scandinavian countries and also some communities. And so the premise was international taxation was essentially an event unilateral, bilateral event. So multilateral, very rare. Effectively, we have over the last 10 or 12 years, with all the efforts to focus on the transparency, tax transparency, internationally speaking. Uh, so the effort, multilateral effort was tax transparency, post-2008 crisis, from 2009 onwards, with the multilateral convention opening with the signatories, uh, interest ones, we had exchange of information, multilater multilaterality was internationally known very intensively, as never before. If you go back to 98, or oh, harmful tax competition of OECD, you know that there, there is a spark, a beginning of a perception, uh, a problem that was not uh, easily to find a solution in literality. But there was not the environment uh, to solve that differently. So, multi 
multilaterality has a link with debate. We, in countries that are developing countries, we face the legitimacy of OECD. The BEPS project is here, like a kind of blessing of G20. And so, as there is the digital printing of uh, G20, so there is more legitimacy. But in fact, it, it's a project of OECD that is managed by it. And uh, this management of OECD being the center of production of global policies is something that is not well accepted by the peripheric states, but the sub-global, because the voice is not high. The, the, they do not have voice, in fact, in the decision-making of the organization. So with that, it's been used in BEPS project. The experience that was very well in transparency, tax transparency aspect, that was the kickoff concerning the multilateral experience. So uh, Transparency Tax Global Forum, it was an essay that worked very well. And there you had in the group ad hoc, the OECD, the mainstream that is open. There is over a hundred participants developing countries, emerging economies with important pr uh, presence. So there was a mitigation of the criticism that was strong, uh, not in, in the case of the perspective of the global countries, but the legitimacy of VCD to have the center of production of uh, taxing policies. This experience, in fact, migrates to BEPS project with a, a landmark. Uh, if the idea is having multilaterality with the only way out to develop the problem, the, to solve the problems, uh, so you have tax competition problem. And related to that, uh, locally or internationally, it requires solutions that are multilateral ones. So it's difficult. Dosmetically speaking, uh, one state alone does not solve uh, a tax uh, wars. Uh, so, because uh, internationally, it's the same thing. You do not solve the problem in terms of uh, competence globally. A country alone never does anything, even a strong one like United States. In this sense, uh, that's the multilaterality involved with an agreement. And uh, in, naturally, if this agreement is closed, only with OECD, uh, so in terms of versatility, it's limited. Uh, so the idea is having the inclusive landmark bringing all the countries inside this agreement, the debate, and to establish minimum standards that you have to follow as a member of the inclusive framework. So you see a significant difference between what was the BEPS project originally and what you're seeing now in the debates with pillar one and two that are shown. Because in a general way, the BEPS original one had recommendations with flexibility that was um, more or less adequate to the adoption of the changes or adequations, uh, or adequacies, sorry. So in the context of the debate of pillar one and two, we know that there is a premise, there is a requirement of alignment that is much bigger. So the efforts in this line, we want everybody to accept the result of this project. In the landmark, the inclusive one, we have a minimum standard to adopt four actions of BEP projects. And 
you have the transparency and the exchange of information and transparency and substance and uh, basically uh, against the shop uh, use of conventions and the, th the third one is uh, a theme that is central uh, post bept world because you have uh, differences the absence of a global system of the solution of this system of course there there is no viability in terms of uh, legal security or safety i won't go deep first how we have this theme in brazil two of these themes action five and six will be object of a presentation of my friend paul rosembla but we see that brazil is totally aligned with commitments taken members of the inclusive uh, framework and uh, the fifth one we have the uh, the excise exchange information constantly and we altered our definition of uh, privileged fis uh, tax regime to inclusive and substantive uh, economic viability we did not uh, we are not signatories of uh, the six but our uh, treaties our control rules concerning abuse of use of convention i always uh, play with these words i think the other rules uh, uh, will simply trigger the bomb uh, so it's like uh, a circular problem. The treat per se will be an instrument of uh, tax planning, and I'll have to have mechanism to combat this planning, this tax planning. Uh, so uh, concerning the speed up of Brazil to approve the multilateral convention uh, of mutual assistance is being approved, and we've done and we exchanged information about it. And finally, concerning the actions, first time ever, we have a regulation of MAP. Uh, there is MAP in Brazil now, the last statistics of MAP. We have since 2016, uh, or in Brazil in 2018, we started with inventory of 11 cases. We had new cases, six in 2019, and we ended 19 cases in 2018. So most of these cases were transfer price cases. Just to talk about another object, that's the end of my presentation, just to complete my 15 minutes, concerning the reports of BEPS reports, something interesting we had in, in our re report, the explicit manifestation of Brazil. I will maintain my transfer price and I will solve eventual conflicts or double taxation that may rob, crop up with this standard. And that's why we went very quickly with having the map working all right. That's the amicable understanding. Now we know that position in Brazil changed due to initiative that we had in 2017 of adhesion to the OECD. And now the position that we had in end of uh, the report with actions of level 10, and we dropped that. And uh, we are trying to align to the standards of OECD. That's the introduction I wanted to make. We have to understand that things changed. There is just a, something else to comment. Okay, conclusions, not everything multilateral. The heart of international taxation, when you do the distribution apportionment, uh, so uh, of revenue, uh, so we have much more now, and we don't have the, uh, we, uh, we can say that in Brazil, with the convention, we are in a very good situation. Uh, so international taxing is not multilateral nowadays. It's still an event that's ba basically unilateral. 
Thank you, Adriana. Thank you, Professor Serge. Excellent presentation for this important topic. It's important for us to do a general review so all of you view to be in the same foot. Thank you for the first explanations. Now I pass the floor to Professor Paulo, who will address more details, actions, BEPS 5 and 6, and the main aspects and controversies regarding Brazil's point of view. Professor Paulo Rosenblatt, you have the floor. Good afternoon. I'm very pleased and it's a privilege to be part of this fantastic Congress of IBDT. Thank you for the invitations by the organizers, Professor Luis Eduardo Schwery, Maris Oliveira, and I congratulate the chairman of this panel, João Dacio Rolim, friend since the PhD in the University of London, and also on behalf of the moderator, Adriana Brito. This presentation I'll be doing will address action five and six of BEPS plan, addressing the main aspects, controversies, and the main outlooks regarding Brazil's point of view. Action five of BEPS deals with countering harmful tax practices more effective, effectively, I'm sorry, taking into account transparency and substance. The main aspects of this action are the following. It serves to avoid harmful tax practices, guiding and guaranteeing uniformity of actions regarding measures at a global level. This is very important and tries to set forth criteria to identify, identify a preferable regime and potentially harmful and to list some of the criteria that I will now list on action five of bets. So mo mobile taxable activities different from operational and commercial activities, a tax regime different from the one enforced on domestic plan for those companies headquartered in the country. And four main points, the regime reduce or, or avoids taxing on fin mobile ta financial revenues of other activities is prohibited for economic domestic activities and the regime has no transparent. And Sergio and they mentioned a lot about transparency. There's no sharing of informa tax information in this regime. And to set forth eight factors, definition, artificial definition of tax basis, uh, so it affects harmfully the transfer price and they're exempt also or taxation, the tax rate of negotiable calculation and existing or confidentiality rules access of a wide range of treaty to avoid by double taxation and TP and it's uh, the regime, it's, it's a vehicle to minimize tax. In addition to these factors, the action aims towards to guarantee the integrity of the systems. How is it then addressing issues related to regime applied to mobile activities, as mentioned before, that corrodes unfairly tax basis of countries, distorting the localization of the capital and services? Therefore, the plan recommends above all the test evidence of economic activity of substantial nature it's in the plan and finally it intends to adopt several measures that to encourage a uh, environment of fair and free tax competition based on two main pillars substance and transparency what do we have in this first pillar which is substance the, it aims towards removing the purely formal location of income capital in order to reduce the tax amount due. So, substance is more important than the way, the form. And then the second point, it aims to establish a connection between the place where activities are effectively carried out and where the payment of taxes is made. This correlation is fundamental for the BEPS project, and we adopt 
about the nexus approach, which is a, an exam of nexus causal, a proportionality requirement of correlation between the benefit granted to any to the, sorry, the taxpayer and any advantages betrayed to the country and system take into account the expenses by company. The nexus approach was created for issues related to proper intellectual property. The second pillar, it's regarding transparency. So the dear Sergio André has already mentioned previously, which means the exchange of tax information between countries as the key issue. So this is the criteria presented by BEPS to guarantee that tax information are relevant for countries and administra tax administration of countries and not to impose a huge uh, burden to the country administration of the receiving country or the country that supplies the information. The main object of tax information is this is a specific decisions that are given by tax authority to a taxpayer or group or taxpayers. So Professor Sergio André, the news where English speaking languages language adopts a decision. The fourth point of transparency is to establish a reciprocal treatment rule in the exchange of information, including the period before the BEPS plan. So for the, and there's a rule also which is important. There's a limit clear by BEPS that used in the information must be limited to issues related to tax purposes only. So the second action, that I will address during the presentation. Action six, six on preventing the granting of treaty benefits in an appropriate circumstances. So this action, it deals with the abuse of tax treaty to avoid double taxation, especially regarding the treaty shopping and clear innovation in this action which is shedding light on these agreements they don't have the objective to generate double non-taxation and to avoid in general double taxation as it was construed the previous treaties so following this sense it, it intention is to improve the o c d on the preamble or so saying that this the they intend to improve the model convention by including the preamble on the DTT, but it's deemed as inappropriate. And then the action number six, especially regarding the file 10 of treaties that deals with direct, direct right to benefits, suggests and recommends the inclusion of a clause of limiting of benefit, limitation on benefits, LOB clause in England, as long as adapted to the tax system of each country, the introduction of a general rule anti elision no principal purpose test, PPT. So a combination of both LOB clause and PPT test that has this function of avoiding and preventing treaty shopping. That is one of the cause of the LOB, the BEPS proposed a general rule anti-illusion or to adopt a combination of LOB and PPT for treaties. And also it tries to identify the main uh, policy that states must adopt when signing a treaty with another country or the PPT and the outlook for Brazil. Uh, Sergio André Rocha just mentioned that Brazil is committed to put Act into action the practice of minimum standards of five and six. But in addition to the review the items that it's part of its previous treaties. As said by the Sergio André, we have ratified the Convention on Mutual System in Tax Matters in 016, fostering transparency and later also ratified the multilateral agreement of competent authorities for automatic exchange of financial information. This is the first one. So Brazil also adopted the common reporting standard CRS 
for the proper classification of tax information as mentioned and the country by country reporting for the exchange of information regarding multinational companies acting on different jurisdictions where they are. Since 2000, Brazil, Portugal Treaty, Brazil has included LB clauses in different degrees and forms, except the Treaty Brazil-Ukraine 02. Of the 32, we have many, of the 32 DTT, 24 contain some sort of LOB clause, either with objective criteria as Luxembourg, Portugal, South Africa, Peru, Craig, Professor Craig West will address, Trinidad and Tobago, and not yet ratified the treaty with Paraguay, we have LOB clauses with subjective criteria like Chile, Mexico, and Turkey, and mixed criteria for those treaties executed with Israel, Russia, and Venezuela. So, Inland Revenue, Professor Sergio also mentioned a bit, uh, enforces a definition of econ substantial economic activity in the normative instruction number 1.658-16. It requires for holdings located in privileged tax regimes a proof of operational capacity, which includes through two requirements. First, physical structure in countries of origin and own employees. In Bra the new treaties, Brazil, Singapore, Argentina, and Switzerland, always Brazil, which one of these countries includes the first part of the DTT and also clauses as LOB and treaties, Brazil, Switzerland, Brazil, Argentina, includes the test of PPT. What are the controversies that we have? In spite of Brazil being committed with the BEPS plan, it lacks a bit of coherence and clarity regarding the purposes. In a certain way, Brazil is still very distant from the international debate. At the moment, Brazil is debating a reform of consumption taxation, if you will introduce an IVAT, domestic VAT, and today we are amazed with the judgment of tax um, matter regarding virtual actions by the Supreme Court and its ruling. So this is a huge debate at issue now. And also morality in Brazil, tax morality, I'm sorry, in Brazil is still very low regarding com it compares with developed countries, including tax lesion and tax. So we have big tax paper that it's not paying taxes and we see in the newspapers and main publications. Still, we have some judicial issues that not solved in Brazil regarding the relation hierarchy between domestic and treaty provisions in case of conflict, as we've seen recently a ruling by the Supreme Court that we call Volvo case. And the existence also of a G a uh, a r in the concept of tax avoidance are contentious provisional measures 685 slash 15 that g a a r regulation tax planning disclosure statement so we have the article 116 of the tax code and introducing a statement of this obligatory disclosure and tax planning we have all these points refused, or both points refused by the National Congress in the Administrative Court for Tax Appeals, the highest court regarding mixed tax issues, inconsistent approach to tax avoidance. So, ruling, applying simulation, then the business, so business purpose test, step transactions, form and substance. Supreme Court started to rule in. ADI 2.334 of the sole paragraph 116 is constitutional or not. And this can generate several problems, both domestically and internationally wise. And then we have the IF 
a general general report in O2 Oslo, Norway. Some of the conclusion of this report, those countries without a general rule that it's positive, will not avoid the fix, the excise to find different ways to avoid tax planning known as abusive or aggressive. And on the other hand, the test of the main purpose is the, the of PPT, sort of weird and not that known by the Brazilian law. So this was my presentation. Thank you very much, Adriana. I just like to conclude saying that the new PPT, including test PPT, like Portugal and Argentina and wide, and they have vague and ambiguous consequences. This is one of the main problems I foresee today. One of the main purposes of any agreement, operation, benefit, or object on purpose of convention and attributing to the taxpayer burden of proof that the main object of the regime agreement, it was not the benefit of by the treaty, but for the tax authority can deny the benefit if it is if it's deemed as reasonable to conclude that the tax avoidance was the main purpose considering all the relevant facts and circumstances. This sort of wording can bring further debates to the table in Brazil. This was an, an overall what I wanted address regarding actions five and six. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Paulo. Excellent presentation. I would like to follow this line of thought of the recent decision by Minister, Minister Carmen Lúcia to address further the subject. If we look a bit more in details, this ruling, what she understood, she understood that the rule on pa sole paragraph of Article 160 of CTN must be construed as anti elision In this sense, the issue I would like to place for the debate is the following. What are the possible repercussions for Brazil in the international scenario in the assumption the STF Supreme Court could confirm this, that we don't have an anti lesion standard or rule? Would like to say first, Professor Serge, would you like to take the floor first, Professor Serge? First of all, I think that this affirmative say that uh, the decision takes this avenue, we would only, we would have no way to control tax avoidance. We had discussions about it, very relevant, very powerful, with the participation of Luis Flavio, Schwer, and myself. It's not the time to have this debate again. If you have interest on in the theme, about the event that is in YouTube. We discussed the theme with all the participants, Leonardo Alvin of PFN, Lan of Bosch PFN, and Quiroga. The discussion from the point of view of Carmen Lúcia shouldn't be discussed now. I think that it makes sense to discuss, for instance, considering the protocol the Brazil Argentina that was VPT in force, uh, there is an interview action relation between this aspect and the paragraph 216. In principle, I would say it's not easy. The discussion about the PPT firmed uh, in a treatment, uh, in, an, in an agreement between Brazil and Argentina. It goes parallelly to the domestic discussion that is in the high courts. I believe that the treaty, uh, it involves the, pers the bilateral perspective, as I explained before, the bilateral perspective. When you have an agreement, a treaty, you're discussing, discussing the circumstances, you're just setting aside the, the power to tax or the position to tax. Professor Schwery has said that you're, you have the 
treaty about that. Uh, there is a discussion that Professor Schwede has done concerning this wave, and that's the perspective. If the countries agree, that is an important point, because many times we that are in practice uh, see the international treaty from the perspective of the taxpayers but it is the perspective of the states that have to be considered in areas like tax planning exchange of information the treaty is focused on limitation of the state power of waiving and uh, not doing anything. So specifically in this field, unless, as people say, the treaty would be violating the constitution itself. It's a very important debate. It's interesting, as Paulo has commented, we don't have a position about it yet. But let us say that Brazil Argentina uh, protocol violates the, the constitutional clause. I think it's difficult to accept unless you have argument in the sense directly of lack of uh, inconstitutionality present there. Uh, so so I don't think that this discussion of the PBT clause with the paragraph 166, uh, the, it will win no matter how, it will do not change the discussion we have here. Uh, there is no impact on that. And so, what calls our our attention is that it started 19 years after the action has been sentenced. So we have a pandemic and we are having that virtually. The ministers do not communicate directly and the parties do not, parties do not have opportunity to show their point of view. And now the vote of the ruling of the Carmen Lucia, it does not present the debate that we have over the last 20 years. Okay, it seems that uh, the 20 years had no power, no consideration. Well, I want to be the voice of that because it cannot be ignored, the debate. Now, there is a point that is very favorable to acknowledge the right, the constitutional right of the taxpayers. I think it's important to take it, the organization concerning the taxpayers to avoid the, the origin. So, of course, we have to follow the line of action. But the point is that, good question, what you're saying, that the clause per se, the instrument per se, is not a tax avoidance rule or anti that. So I think that when you present the 124 law, it's a anti-abuse and the code per se 149 article 149 it's there so the high court would say it's redundant there is no need of anything and so in fact we have the doubt we do not know if it the tax avoidance is compatible with our constitution. Even if it's revoked this paragraph and we have a new law with a new tax of anti-tax avoidance. So what do we do? Four ministers already vote with Carmen Lucia. It's been suspended. And I think that in this sense, there is impact, yes. First, domestically speaking, because BEPS says to the states, to the signatories, you have to adopt an anti-tax avoidance rule, and it forces uh, aggressive tax planning concerning abuse in Brazil. And maybe we have some problem of interpretation of PPT. And if they say it's a tax avoidance norm, uh, so, you can simply drain the purpose of BEPS. As I said previously, it may generate more offenses because in this case, uh, of course we have work for tax people in Brazil. So it will, in case we have more disputes. Okay, my last sentence, just to wrap up. 
the high court some years ago sentenced the schedule break by excise because so the this clause was accepted uh, so but they changed their idea according to the agreement signed by brazil so we have to be very careful because it may happen again we can celebrate and in the future we have to have a twist of the tail thank you very much of course there are lots of the themes and discussions uh, with this subject but we have to carry on with our panel Thank you for the excellent presentations. Now, carrying on, I would like to invite Professor Craig to bring his view about the BEP state compared point of view. That's a comparison. And of course, the PPT potential controversies in South Africa. Uh, Thank you very much, um, Adriana, for um, for that introduction and thank you to IBDT and uh, especially to Professors Schwery and uh, Luis Flavio um, for the for the invitation. Um, it's a delight to be here and and the I'm going to be dealing with two actions. So firstly action six on PPT and then I will also be dealing with um, action 13 and we'll speak a little bit about dispute resolution in a moment. But if we just follow on the conversation that's been happening already with respect to PPT, in particular the PPT um, issues within South Africa, I think there are, it's useful to have a little bit of background first. And the first bit of the background is that while South Africa has signed the MLI, and we did so right at the start of uh, the MLI, we haven't ratified it yet. And this is quite an important process. And so, so the benefit for me, of course, is that the moment you're speaking about something that's in the hypothetical, at best, you can never be wrong. Uh, and at, at worst, even if I am wrong, it might be changed in the future. So I wasn't wrong to, to, to start off with. So it, it, it's, quite a, it's quite a good position to be in. So if we have a look at, at, at the fact that South Africa has not signed um, the MLI, of course, PPT is not in force in South Africa. So um, what the issues that we are raising are the potential issues that we've, that we've identified at this point. Now, this MLI process in South Africa has stalled, partly because of the way it was presented to our parliament, to our standing committee on finance. And in that committee, the... Um, a number of issues were raised by our budgetary office to the uh, national treasury in charge of uh, presenting the treaty. And a lot of it is along similar themes to what Brazil and, and my Brazilian colleagues have just been presenting. Asking questions like, are treaties not regressive for developing countries? So should we be signing these at all? Should we not rather be adopting unilateral measures? Are these not better measures to resolve um, double taxation? We worried about the capacity and the complexity of this instrument in its implementation. Uh, what are the financial implications for South Africa if we sign this? Um, you know, is this going to be erosive to our tax base? So all of these issues, I think, play an important role in understanding where we are in this process. The other aspect is that we already have a general anti-avoidance rule, a GAR. Um, and because of its similarities in some respects to PPT, National Treasury were trying to sell it to our parliament that this is no change in policy. We, we're simply adopting PPT. We've chosen PPT because it's exactly the same as our GAR, which isn't actually the case. And a number of issues will arise as a result of this. So I think um, there a number of issues arise. Parliament were also told, well, none of the MLI introduces changes in policy. But of course, Parliament reminded National Treasury that they had never ratified BEP, uh, the BEPS project. And so uh, the MLI is their first opportunity to see something to, to ratify. So the other important aspect is South Africa uh, adopted PPT. We did not elect to adopt LOB provisions. So uh, LOBs is not part of our treaty policy. Our notification in terms of the MLI was in fact to 
for all our covered tax agreements where there is a, a co-signatory to override our existing LOB provisions and replace it with the PPT provisions. So we were not choosing to, to maintain uh, LOB provisions. Of course, some of our big trading partners like the US are not going to, to take that lying down and they will keep their LOBs uh, in any event. So we will, we will see where that, um, where that takes us. And of course you need matching uh, for the MLI to apply in any event. So what are some of the possible issues? Well, the first major issue we have is, of course, what is going to happen with PPT and GAR? Our treaties, once, inco once incorporated, have uh, equal standing to our domestic law, which means that GAR and PPT will have the same standing. So this is going to create an enormous uncertainty as to which will apply. And certainly this creates uh, an enormous problem because our GAR, as it is framed, is slightly narrower in focus than the PPT as it is framed. So it becomes a question as to which, which is going to apply. We also have enormous concerns in that there's, in, there's this great silence with respect to PPT as to how it should operate. Uh, what are the operational procedures for PPT? Are we going to have to follow domestic legal remedies if PPT is applied? How are we going to resolve the issue? How is the taxpayer going to take on this issue if PPT is actually invoked in a treaty matter? So we need to see still as well whether it's going to pass our constitutional tests of administrative justice and fairness. And so we, we left uncertain as to, as to those aspects as well. Our new GAR, as it is currently framed, has also since its adoption in, in 2006, still has not yet been tested in our courts. So many of the principles that are similar to PPT haven't yet been tested in our own court. So it would be interesting to see not only how we're going to deal with our own GAR, but how is PPT going to fare in our, in our court system? Um, and of course, judges will always um, couch things within their domestic framework as well. So they'll, well, they'll take all these other aspects into account uh, it may be interesting to see how this is going to play out. So while we have purpose of interpretations, we're wondering as to the extent of the reach, what extent is the preamble going to play in the interpretation of the PPT and its application, the new preamble as adopted in the MLI, how is that going to, to play out? And then similar to the Brazilian issues, we're worried about the burden of proof. To what extent is the burden going to lie on the tax administration to some, to some respects? To how much are they going to have to prove? We have worries about all the undefined terms like benefit. What is benefit going to mean? Uh, our GAR test refers to the main or um, the, the sole or main purpose, yet PPT refers to one of the principal purposes. This is a much wider ambit than our GAR. And so we, we're having enormous difficulty to see how this is going to play out. So what relief is going to uh, apply? We're not too sure yet. Uh, and we don't know to what extent the burden is going to be shifted between the authority and the taxpayer because there's, no, there's none of these operational procedures uh, in place. Ultimately, the problem with PPT, and I think the problem facing most countries, is that in its design, what OECD failed in its wisdom to think about was how this rule is going to be domesticated into national systems. And that failure to consider the complexity of, of that uh, domestication, I think, is one of the failures in its design. And so I think this is going to play out amongst um, an, a number of countries. So... That's all I really wanted to say on, on PPT. If we move to action 14 and we look at, at, at MAP, it's, it's useful, I think, to look at the experience of various countries with respect to, to MAP in looking at a comparison between developing and developed countries. So let's, let's uh, take this journey to, to have a look at these, um, at these aspects. Um, so the first thing is, well, why does this action action matter and why is mutual agreement so important? Um, part of it was that it was going to improve dispute resolution. 
And of course, what we're seeing now, if you look at the 2017 OECD model, is an increasing reference to mutual agreement. And because it appears in multiple instances, what this means and what this means for a caseload for a country is going to become increasingly important. And so we'll have a look at the caseload in a moment. But if we just have a look at a few of the direct treaty references here. So the first one we find is in Article 3.2, which the OECD claims is a clarification uh, to Article 3.2 is that any term not defined therein shall unless the context otherwise requires, and then take note of the bolded words, all the competent authorities agree to a different meaning pursuant to the provisions of Article 25. In other words, a mutual agreement procedure. Now that, that, that is, I find an incredibly worrying insertion into the, into the treaty. And if this finds its way into the treaty network in terms of giving competent authorities this kind of delegated power to interpret terms of a treaty uh, and provide it with a, a, a different meaning. Uh, that, that I find in, incredibly disturbing. We also find it, of course, now in the um, residence tiebreakers, both for individuals and for uh, corporate entities in Article 4. And uh, we also see it as regards to the mode of application for dividends and interest. So we see it in multiple instances. And so we need to really understand what this procedure is and what it's going to do. So in doing any comparison between developing and developed countries, it is of course always important to look at what is the experience. And so if we have a look at this experience, I thought just contrasting two graphs next to one another from the global framework perspective. So the first is the actual map caseload distribution. Now this is directly from the OECD reported statistics. So of the 90 countries or well, the 91 countries that are reporting in their map data, this is how the numbers play out. Now the developed countries as I've framed them are only 39 of those 91 countries. So the balance is developing countries and developed countries, but look at the global caseload distribution. Developing countries in BRICS, minute caseload. And you look at the developed country caseload, it is absolutely enormous. The top 18 countries of the developed countries count for 80% of the global map cases. If we take a look at the BRICS, the BRICS figures are actually inflated here because they're inflated because India is the bulk of those cases. It's 841 of 1047 cases. So if we actually break it down, if we strip out India, which is a large part, and we strip out China, which is the next biggest, and we just look at South Africa, Russia, and Brazil together, Combined, we, we, we take a, a caseload total of 95 cases. That's less than 1% of the caseload for our economies. And we're meant to be the emerging economies, the, the economies that, that um, are, are larger in, in a developing uh, world space. If we look at Germany's cases, they on their own have 12% of the global cases. So we can see an enormous difference between the caseload distribution. But then contrast that with the actual growth in cases. And if we just look at the opening, uh, the opening numbers of 2018 and the closing numbers of 2018 in terms of the growth of cases, you see that developing country cases are growing exponentially, BRICS less so, and develop, pink, uh, developed countries even less so. So it, it's, it's an interesting contrast to see this case load versus the actual uh, case load growth. Now, the OECD stats then further break it down into transfer pricing cases and other cases. Transfer pricing cases being any attribution cases under Article 7, as well as, well as any uh, arm's length adjustment issues under Article 9. So it's, it's covering those two provisions. If we have a look at that distribution, so following the same pattern, Again, developing in BRICS countries, small distribution, developed countries, the bulk of the caseload. But if we have a look, interestingly here, the caseload growth, yes, it's still on, on the high side for the developing countries, but we're closer to the developed countries. So transfer pricing cases seem to be growing at, at a similar rate. If we move then to other cases, this is where you see 
a much larger exponential growth. Now, where would you find these things? These are your residence tiebreakers and other matters. Um, but what is, what is very important to realize is that these are only cases that are instigated by the taxpayer. This does not include the cases that may arise under Article 3.2, which is the competent authorities themselves agreeing on interpretation, which, while it is a mutual agreement procedure, is excluded from this caseload, this caseload numbering. So these are just cases around um, taxpayer-initiated um, issues. So if we have a look at, at this, it's also very useful to, to be aware that it's taking around on average, 30 months to resolve a transfer pricing case and around 17 months to resolve other cases. Now that seems a very long time for a dispute resolution mechanism. I accept, of course, that court cases can take far longer. But what if we're looking to try and improve dispute resolution, I'm certain that industry would prefer a much shorter turnaround time for dispute resolution than is currently the case even in a MAP scenario. So I think it's then important to say, well, what does the, why does this even matter? Do we care what the caseload is? Well, I think it clearly demonstrates a number of issues. There is definite inexperience in the developing countries with respect to MAP. We are starting out in this process. We do not have high, the high caseloads of the developed world. Our cases are clearly on the rise, which immediately brings the concern, do we have the capacity within our revenue authorities to deal with the increasing caseload? So is this going to be an efficient mechanism or are we going to see not only an exponential rise in cases, but an exponential rise in the time it takes to resolve the cases, which then it speaks to me as a failure of the process. And then despite all these statistics, which, which show a glowing result if you look at the resolution of these cases, you know, 57% of them result in resolution of the double tax issues. But that success or failure isn't easily measured because of the secrecy of the process of mutual agreement procedures. There is an enormous secrecy. And so if we have a look here, what are my concerns around mutual agreement as a, as, a, as a sustainable dispute resolution mechanism? Well, first of all, there's no obligation for the parties to reach an agreement. They must only endeavor to reach an agreement in terms of the article. So that's an immediate concern. Then we have uh, what we call the competent authority. Well, I call it the competent authority black box. I've heard other commentators call it the black hole, which I think is a little bit more aggressive because in a black hole, nothing ever escapes. Uh, a black box at least is secure and maybe one day we will see the information. Uh, so I'm a little bit more hopeful in my term of black box rather than black hole of competent authorities. But it speaks to the enormous lack of transparency the process has. Once the process has been instigated, while they may ask the taxpayer for information, Nothing else happens. The taxpayer has no right to participate in the process. It is a discussion between the competent authorities of each state. And what, what decision is made is simply communicated to the taxpayer. There is no transparency. We don't know whether the competent authorities are potentially susceptible to corruption. And so favored decisions being made for some taxpayers and unfavorable decisions being made for other taxpayers that are in competition with you know, the, the corrupt individual's friends. Now, I would sincerely hope that that would not be the case, but let's be a little bit pessimistic as well or realistic, however you want to put it, uh, rather than just having a pure optimism about the process. So there is concerns around the competent authority and who is fulfilling that position. I'm enormously concerned about the powers granted to the competent authorities to interpret, adjust, unilaterally resolve the issue, uh, the, the issues with no duty to disclose the outcomes. So we don't know whether there is consistency in their interpretation, consistency in their adjustment, and consistency in the methods that they employ to resolve these issues. So are they susceptible to lobbying to resolve an issue in a particular way? I'm concerned. As a delegated authority, there seems to be a significant 
lack in, in, in oversight over these competent authorities. And so I think there is the potential because of this lack of transparency for in enormous inequality. Um, even if the competent authority agreements were published in some form, some redacted form, so that the pure detail isn't known, but we can see the consistency of the decisions that would already be uh, of, of benefit. So I have some enormous concerns for the application in a developing world scenario. So if, if I'm this concerned about the mutual agreement procedure, why don't I just go straight to arbitration? Won't arbitration solve everything, certainty, publication of results? Well, the detail isn't really showing this to be a positive outcome either. Uh, it's showing that arbitration is unlikely to be adopted. Why? Because of the 94 countries that have signed the MLI, only 30 appear to have adopted some form of arbitration. And I say some form because of the flexibility and optionality within the MLI. And of those 30, only three are developing countries currently reporting map statistics. So to me, this looks like it's not a massive uptake in, in arbitration. Now, why? Why are we staying, standing back from, from arbitration? Well, arbitration very often works when you have two, uh, two powers that are of equal uh, weight. So arbitration tends to work quite well in those kinds of situations. When you have unequal powers, arbitration could be used potentially as a bullying mechanism to achieve a particular result. So we could see problems there. It could also be a lack of experience. And what we could also see is perhaps it is too early for a global arbitration answer. It might be that we're looking for a regional response first before a global one. Now, why do I say that? If we have a look at an African position, South Africa has said, no, we're not taking up the mandatory uh, arbitration provisions in the MLI. We've said we've, we've lodged our non-member country position against the OECD model in this regard. We will not include the arbitration provision. Yet when the same provisions appear in regional models, we have not lodged any objection. Now that speaks to me to a number of different aspects. One is the power that South Africa has in, within its own region. So maybe it's willing to take on arbitration as a stronger power first before worrying about the global stage. So I think we're going to see developing countries maybe testing the water with arbitration regionally, but I think there's an enormous reluctance to open arbitration uh, globally. But even within the region, you see pushback against arbitration. Uh, in, the, in the ATAF model, uh, which follows largely the OECD model, so it includes an arbitration provision of the countries that participate in that process, which would be around about um, between 20 and 30 countries, 10 have said, we're not going to put in arbitration, even at a regional basis. So that doesn't look like arbitration is going to be the answer to resolve the dispute resolution mechanism. MAP doesn't seem to be the perfect solution. So I'm hoping I'm hopeful that we will see some, um, some improvements to these processes. So at that point, I'll leave my presentation at, 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 the, at this point. Thank you. Okay, Professor Craig, muito obrigada pelas, pelas excelentes explanações aqui, sobretudo os dados que você apresentou. Mainly the data that you've presented, I think this is a very important, relevant subject. And uh, due to time constraint, now Professor Natalia will share with us her thoughts about the main challenges concerning implementation of transfer price implementation and also the recent uh, ingression of Colombia to OECD. And, uh, April this year, Colombia is the 37th country of OECD. Now, Natalia. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you, IBDT, for the invitation, Professor Suelen. Eu vou falar em... Everyone, 
Um, I, I share also Sergio's sentiments on regretting not being able to be there um, and meeting everyone in person in Brazil. But I do congratulate um, IBDT for moving forward with this online initiative, which has been very successful. Um, we do have 343 people were with us. So, so thank you everyone um, for sticking around. Um, so I'm going to be sharing my screen to talk a little bit about the challenges that we're facing in the transfer pricing area. Um, and the transfer pricing, as you've seen um, in the first seminar and um, in some of the presentations in this panel as well, um, is one area that, that represents a lot of dollars in controversy. Um, so it is really very important that developing countries take a look at the new challenges that have come up with um, all the BEPS rules. Um, and I think to, to talk about the main challenge for every developing country, um, and this includes Colombia as a new member um, of the OECD, is actually understanding the arms length standard. Um, we saw this morning um, with Professor Shreddy's presentation that the arm's length um, standard has been somehow changed or dropped <laughs> um, in some of the new discussions with the digital, um, the, the, you know, the resolving the challenges of the digitalization of the economy. Um, and what this shows is that, you know, what we used to call a principle, what we used to call the arm's length principle is not really a principle. It's, its contents has been, have been changed so much that I'm even doubtful if we can even call it a standard at this point. Um, and, and it is funny because the BEPS project did recognize that the arms length standard was somehow inadequate um, in the current economy and the current circumstances. And yet um, in the actual outcomes and papers, um, it continued to push for the continuation of the arms length um, under this new value creation paradigm. Um, and what is most weird about this value creation paradigm is that everyone has a different definition for it. Um, no one can really agree uh, on what adds value um, in the, you know, in practical circumstances and in each of the industries that participate um, in the global economy. And, the, you know, a testimony of that is how difficult it's been to, to agree on how much value is added by the market um, in this pillar one solution that, that we discussed this morning in the first panel. Um, and, you know, the, the, even if we follow that the value creation principle that has been introduced um, in this uh, post beps world, we still have a lot of complexity to manage. Um, we have hard to value intangibles, financial transactions, intra-group services, um, guidance that now take um, non-market conditions into account. Uh, we, we now have to talk about implied guarantees, shared strategic management services, which were not um, available, you know, in the first definition of the arm's length um, standard. So what we're seeing now is something that um, my co-panelists have mentioned so far, which is an increase in the tax administration powers to define the contents um, domestically of each of these standards. Um, we, we also have um, a new trend within the arm's length, um, which is a new uh, preeminence of simplified methods. Um, and this includes safe harbors, predetermined margins, the sixth method, um, even the apportionment that we're seeing in amount A. And I think these um, uh, new, this new importance that we're granting to simplified methods. Um, really shows a, a very big claim for tax certainty. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to hear um, Flavio and Aouj this morning uh, mentioning that in the convergence of Brazilian transfer pricing rules with the OECD, um, tax certainty and simplicity will be kept. Um, so I, I really hope for the best um, in that area because um, what we're seeing in BEPS it's really increased complexity and obviously with the increased complexity and the increased subjective powers of the tax administration, um, 
we're, we're seeing less simplicity and less certainty. Um, again, there is an emphasis on the actual conduct of the parties. Um, Professor Rosenblatt already mentioned that there's a, a you know more uh, emphasis on the substance rather than the contractual allocation of functions, um, risks and assets. Um, but as, as many practitioners here know, um, even switching the actual conduct is still easy if you only focus on functions, risks and assets as the only three value creating pillars. Um, so there's still, you know, um, a lot of issues that, that will not be resolved and that are being very hard to deal with um, for countries like Colombia or, or developing countries um, in general. You know, we have to focus only on functions, risks and assets, and those are very easy to transfer, even, you know, when we talk about the actual conduct. Um, there is another development in the BEPS project on cash boxes. Um, now they can only receive a, a risk-free return, um, but it, it is very hard to define what is a cash box. Um, here in Latin America, there are a lot of investments coming from the Caribbean. Um, our main company, for example, Ecopetrol, um, with the oil sector in Colombia, um, has more than 35 offshore Caribbean companies. Um, you know, doing business. Are those cash boxes? Um, it's very hard to tell, you know, some of them are called financial companies and, and you know, getting the actual definitions to work in practice and in practical cases is always a very difficult challenge um, for tax administrations and sometimes for taxpayers um, as well. Um, we, we also have, um, a challenge with the commercial rationality of arrangements and a general shift um, towards anti-abuse auditing. And this is this links very well with what we've heard on action six and how um, now the, the main emphasis in even in you know in our transfer pricing audits in Colombia is challenging the business model as such. Um, as a possibly or potentially abusive um, business model. Um, but then again, as, as Craig mentioned earlier, are we really prepared and do we have the capacity to disregard a specific business model for a specific industry and have someone from the tax administration um, requalify the whole model and, and try to derive all the tax consequences from, from a different model from the one that was adopted um, by the taxpayer. So, so I see a huge challenge there in preparing our tax authorities in, in the actual business <laughs> conducted um, by the taxpayers, because if you are going to requalify a business model, you definitely have to know how the business works um, in each of these areas. And um, I'm afraid that in developing countries, it is really very hard to have that level of specialization within um, the transfer pricing auditors in the tax administration. Um, the increased complexity um, in actions 8 to 10 um, has to do with um, things that we've discussed already, you know, is map enough when you have the tax administration um, assigning a valuation on an intangible that you developed, but that you possibly couldn't know how successful it would be once you launch it in the market. You know, because that's the reality of R&D. You know, you, you research a product or a service, um, you test it, and then when it goes out in the market, it can be a star or it can be a failure. And it's really very hard for the taxpayer to know how it's going to you know, do in the actual world. And now you have the possibility of uh, having the Heseta of the tax administration assigning a value once the product has already reached the market. Um, so, you know, is MAP enough or should we have additional tools um, to deal with the different levels of certainty? You know, if you're measuring something after the results are already there, then, you know, you, you, you cannot, <laughs> you cannot compare that with the valuation that the taxpayer could have made when it transferred the intangible outside before launching it into the market. Um, 
uh, I, I applaud that there's a safe harbor there, a 20% safe harbor um, for, the, for a difference between an ex ante and an ex post valuation for hard to value intangibles, but still, you know, the 20% is still very narrow in, in areas like applications or, or digital, you know, uh, entrepreneurial value changes are gigantic depending on how well the public receives the development. Um, in, in the financial services area, um, we see that risk and capital allocation must be aligned, but again, it is still very easy in practice to transfer both the risk and the capital to whichever structure we like. So the problem there, I think, was not yet fully resolved. Um, and then in the intergroup services, we have um, the benefit test, you know, is this service really beneficial to your company? But then you know, the people who are making the evaluation and whether it's beneficial or not, um, are they really prepared to, to make that judgment or, you know, should they defer the judgment to the company because they are the ones who know if it's useful um, or not? Um, then another worrisome aspect of um, Action 10 has to do with the restructurings um, as they may not be accepted if there was any other option realistically available. Um, obviously, we can have huge debates on what is realistically available, what is the definition of that, and, and the person deciding whether other options were available or not might not be fully engaged into the market or the business context of the company in the reorganization. Um, so this might create, again, a lot of disputes. Um, and the cash pooling, uh, I'm sorry, the cost pooling and the indirect charging um, in the services are limited by the comparables and the main object of the, of the company um, rendering the services. Um, but this, again, is very easy to change, you know, at least in Colombia, you can change the object of a company um, with a statute reform and it takes three days to register that. Um, so if you need your company to be a, a, a services company, you can change that very, very easily. Um, so again, a lot of issues still unresolved and a lot of potential for dispute. Um, now going into um, Action 13, um, I think this is a huge challenge for everybody. Um, for the tax administration, it's nowadays absolutely impossible to use the information um, contained in the country by country report because the uses um, that are now allowed are limited for um, you know anonymized risk assessment and most developing country administrations don't yet have you know the IT tools necessary to perform that risk assessment based on that information and then again the information sometimes the information pool is too small to make it anonymized and and to actually conduct a serious um, risk assessment exercise. Um, and then the people who really want to see it from the tax administration, um, or the, you know, the auditors cannot see what's in there. Um, and for the taxpayers, it's also very difficult um, because some of the decisions that were made on how to report and what standards, um, accounting standards to use in the reporting, <coughs> sorry, make it very difficult um, to show an accurate picture of the reality because you're in one sheet of paper trying to reflect um, a global operation with very significant differences in the accounting um, in each of the places where the operation is being conducted. Um, what we have now is um, significant developments in the Action 13 um, country by country report. We have um, a public consultation that I think ended already. There's some public comments that were made that were published in the OECD website. Um, the link is there on the, on the slide. And what we see um, from the public is quite interesting because it's um, a very heavy involvement from civil society um, asking to make the CBC actually publicly available for everyone to see. Um, we also see a claim for lowering the thresholds, you know, only companies uh, earning more than 750 um, million euros are, um, are required to, to fill a country-by-country country report. Um, and all 
uh, well, not all, but many of the commentators are asking to lower the thresholds. And this is, you know, beneficial for developing countries because, you know, 750 million here is really a, a very big number, um, especially if you have to convert those USD into Colombian pesos. Um, we also see a claim to increase the scope of reported information. Um, and this would be useful for the tax administration, um, especially if pillar one and pillar two are going forward. Um, there's a lot of information that they need. You know, if we really are going to talk about global profits and if we are going to administer um, a global solution for the digital economy, then we definitely need to have um, global information on everything having to do with digital um, number of users, active daily users. Um, maybe those kinds of figures will be now a new um, uh, addition to the country by country report. Um, and then obviously they're claiming for allowing for other uses um, besides the high level risk assessment. And um, this is where um, Action 13 will become very relevant. I'm very anxious to see how it plays out. Um, you can all follow that on the OECD um, website. Um, another challenge has to do with the auditing trends. Um, we do have a better dialogue with the tax administration and becoming an OECD member has benefited Colombia in, in the obtention of um, large capacity building seminars and, and large sums for capacity building in general in the tax administration. And that makes the dialogue easier. I'm sorry for the dog. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we, we also see a trend for privileging substance and reform disregarding contracts in transfer pricing audits. Um, we see um, an evidence approach to intra-group services um, that might be difficult for, for taxpayers that are used to a very quick pace in the economy and that, that are not documenting every single step of the way. You know, they have to document the, the person coming into Brazil to render the service has to get the stamp and it has to come into a PDF. And then if he comes to an office, they have to take pictures in the office. And then if the office um, has a seminar or something, there, there has to be a a PowerPoint presentation in the file for that um, meeting. There's got to be a lot of evidence prepared by the taxpayers in order to face the new services challenges in the transfer pricing area. Um, we see a trend for the accumulation of penalties. We, um, in Colombia, for example, the, every transfer pricing audit now has an additional penalty for the legal representative or the CEO and also for the accountant in the company. And those, you know, make the, the, the audits greater and bigger. Um, we see a rejection of comparables and of comparability adjustments, but then again, we don't really have very good regional um, comparables. And then we also see increased auditing on commodities transactions. And this also has to do with a lot of capacity building in, um, in the developing world on how to audit um, the commodities uh, sector. So um, these, these trends um, are, are obviously a challenge for both parties, tax administrations and um, taxpayers. Um, but what they you know, really amount to is um, a lot of uncertainty, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of um, controversies um, and a lot of pressure on the arm's length standard. I, I think that in the long term, we really should reconsider if this is the best way going forward. And I, again, applaud um, Flavio's comment on wanting to keep things simple and certain. Um, but if this is the aim, then maybe the arms length standard might not be the best solution in the long term. Um, Again, only some countries are signing up to mandatory binding solutions. Um, so we have a big challenge in dispute resolution. Um, and this is where I give um, the microphone back to Adriana um, to ask her question. 
Obrigada, muito obrigada, professora Natália, super relevante seus comentários. É, inclusive, é isso. Muito importante seus comentários, e mainly when it refers to the fact that Brazil is looking for isometric in, in transfer price. I think that is very important what you said. Due to time constraint, we'll go straight to the last issue. We we'll go to the last section, and uh, now Professor Craig. And after that, Natalia, please place your comments uh, in a brief. To do final quest, what, Greg, what are the main challenges faced by the developed countries for the implementation of the pro friendly procedure? I think well explained in your organization, excellent exposure on this subject. What are the challenges and how these challenges can be addressed? Could you briefly explain this to us so we can conclude within the given time of the panel? Thank you very much, Professor. All right, I'll be very brief this time no, as opposed to last time. Uh, so let me just uh, say that I think the, the, the critical thing here is for any dispute resolution mechanism, we need to have transparency. We need to um, have visibility and certainty as to the outcomes and the consistency of those outcomes. And I think that is what is currently lacking in the structures that we currently have. Um, so I think we need to see redacted competent authority agreements being um, published. We need to factor in the possibility of, of corruption and how that will be dealt with. So there must be consequences for that. Uh, and I think we need to look very carefully at arbitration as, um, a, a, as a potential tool, but it cannot be a mandatory aspect because I don't think developing countries are going to sign up for it yet. I don't think it's correctly framed in, in the current circumstances. Obrigada, professor Craig. Professora Natália, seus comentários. Thank you very much, professor Craig. And professor Natália, final remarks? Well, I think for, for arbitration, um, I just want to comment on that. I, I do think that arbitration will be pushed through the back door, like Yarif um, mentioned this morning. Um, the, the minimum standards at the MAP forum are being discussed as we speak. And from now until December, there will be a decision whether arbitration, mandatory binding arbitration will become a minimum standard for everyone in the inclusive framework, not just OECD countries. Um, if this happens, um, what we're gonna be facing is developing countries with much less experience, but at least we will be um, on a similar level um, facing arbitration because most countries, even developed countries have not had any experience. Um, in tax arbitration. So I think in the end, this will become a minimum standard. And if this is the case, then we should start getting experience now um, and we can start closing that gap um, in, in the different, uh, different levels of experience. Um, so this is a, a, a provocative position, but, but I think it's the best way to go. They're, they will still require arbitration from us and we better be prepared um, instead of resisting and resisting and then have to adopt it when we have absolutely no experience and they have all the knowledge on their side. Thank you. Obrigada, professora Natalia. Thank you, professor Natalia. Well, with this, I think hugely the panelists, the professors, and those watching us, I hope you made the most of this debate. It was fantastic. Now I pass the floor to the chair, professor João, Rolin for his final remarks and the closing of this panel. Excellent on behalf of IBDT. I thank the panelists, the exchange of experience, and in, in Muito interessante e very interesting. And we had huge similarities be comparing South Africa the points addressed by Professor Craig, Craig and with Colombia. So this panel was very, very interesting regarding the exchange of experience seeing that Brazil is behind, but we are learning less our lessons and the experience is a bit ahead in South Africa and Colombia. So I thank you all for your participation and we are going now to move to the next panel. Thank you.